In this statics problem, we will determine force E that is exerted on the bolt held between the jaws of this pair of pliers. The problem was taken from a book on statics problems by Bedford and Fowler, but here I am referring to a paper by Paul S. Steiff in which this problem was reproduced. I want to use this problem to illustrate two completely different problem-solving methods. The first method is a classical one that has been used to solve statics problems for the last 150 years. The second method comes from systems physics. It is a new and unusual but holistic method. Let us first apply the conventional method. As a first step, we parse the system into rigid bodies. Depending on how we count, this gives us four or five parts. Each body is drawn separately. Then the given forces, for example these 150 Newton, are indicated. At the points where the various parts are connected, we indicate that there is an unknown force in X direction and one in Y direction. Since we assume that there is no bearing friction at the joints, we do not consider any torques. At the bolt, we indicate only normal forces, as there cannot be any cross forces here. The law of action and reaction, also known as Newton's third law of motion, has to be fulfilled between all the bodies. Thus, at point C, force Cx acts towards the right on one body and towards the left on the other body. Force Cy acts upwards on one body and downwards on the other. The case is the same with the forces acting in the other joints. By the way, the free body diagram shown here was also taken from the paper by Paul Steiff. Now we can formulate the equilibrium condition for each body. We shall take the first system and argue in relation to this coordinate system. The X component of force P acts in negative direction, so we enter minus PX in the corresponding equation. At point C, there is another force acting against the X axis, so we enter minus CX. Since there are no other forces acting in this direction, the sum of both forces must amount to zero. Here you can see that CX was probably entered with the wrong sign, but this doesn't matter because if we continue consistently in this way, the sign will turn out right in the end. On the vertical axis, we have the given force of 150 Newton acting in negative Y direction, and which I will call F0. At point P, there is a force component acting in positive direction and at point C, there is a force component acting in minus Y direction. At point E, there is a force component acting in positive direction. All these forces must be entered in the corresponding equation using the right sign. The third equation describes the equilibrium condition in terms of rotation. To formulate this condition, I choose the joint at C as my axis of rotation. The product of the given force F0 and the 130 mm lever arm it acts upon results in a positive torque. The Y component of force P generates a negative torque. According to the lever rule, the corresponding value equals force times a lever arm of 100 mm. The force at point E generates a positive torque with a lever arm of 30 mm. The three equilibrium conditions give us three equations. The sum of all forces in X direction equals zero. The sum of all forces in Y direction equals zero. The sum of all torques of these forces equals zero. The signs can be taken from the drawing and related to the coordinate system. The same procedure is followed for body 2. We choose our axis of rotation at joint D. 
Now we have two forces acting in x direction. Cx acts in positive direction and dx in negative direction. There are three forces acting in y direction. Cy in positive, dy in negative and e also in negative direction. There are only two forces contributing to the torques. Cx generates a negative torque with a 30 mm lever arm and E also generates a negative torque with a lever arm of 30 mm. Here we see again that Cx was probably entered with the wrong sign. For the third body we choose our axis of rotation at P. Again the sum of all X forces and the sum of all Y forces equals zero. Force F generates a negative torque with a lever arm of 100 mm and force DY generates a positive torque with a lever arm of 30 mm. The fourth body is a stabilizer link. A stabilizer link is hinged at both ends. This is why the force must act in the direction of the stabilizer link. The ratio between the two force components therefore equals the ratio between the corresponding lengths of the stabilizer link, which is 70 to 30. Now that we have generated all the equations, we can start solving them. Here are all 10 equations again. With the help of this system of equations, the individual forces can be calculated. The force exerted on the bolt is about 10 times greater than the force exerted on the handles. The pliers, therefore, transform 150 Newton into a gripping pressure of more than 1500 Newton. Forces Cx and Dx are negative. This means that these two forces act in the other direction. Force Px equals the gripping pressure. Here the other components, PY, CY and DY, have been calculated as well. The greatest force is the one acting on bolt C in Y direction. This force is more than 13 times F0. In solving the system of equations, you notice that there are three redundant equations, for example here. Since Px plus Dx equals zero, Dx equals minus Px. Now, according to a second equation, Dx and Cx must be the same. A third equation implies that Cx plus Px also equals zero. Therefore, these three equations are linearly dependent. The method shown here which includes parsing, indicating the forces and torques and formulating the equilibrium conditions, is a tried and tested method that engineering students are taught the world over. It can be acquired with practice and used successfully on statics problems. However, I will now solve the same problem with the help of systems physics. In mechanics, there are six substance-like scalar quantities, namely the three components of momentum and the three components of angular momentum. All six components can create flows, and the flows are coupled through certain conditions. Here are two pictures of the same pliers and a coordinate system. In the top picture I have indicated the x-momentum flows and in the bottom picture I have indicated the y-momentum flows. Let's start with the applied momentum flow. On the bottom handle there is a force acting in positive y-direction, so here a momentum of 150 Newton flows into the pliers. This momentum flow goes back out through the top handle. The outflow of momentum is described by the force acting in negative direction that is indicated here. Now we can draw this momentum flow of 150 Newton that goes from the bottom handle through the top handle. I call it F0. We know that the bolt is being squeezed, so there must be a momentum flow in positive y direction at the bolt. 
I call this momentum flow Y2. In the middle section of the pliers, there is a third momentum flow, which I call Y1. I assume that, between C and D, it flows in the same direction as Y2. Between B and A, it flows in the same direction as F0. Should my assumption be false and the momentum flows in the other direction, then this will become apparent when I solve the equation system. In the middle section, there is also an x-momentum flow. This one, which we call ix1, goes counterclockwise. Using the lever rule, I will now explain why the applied momentum flow induces three other momentum flow circuits. The lever rule says that lateral momentum flows create sources and sinks of angular momentum. In a plane, this rule is not very complicated. If x momentum flows in y direction, or y momentum flows in minus x direction, then a source of z angular momentum is created. I will now use this relationship to link the four momentum flow circuits. The equilibrium condition demands, in each structural element, the sources must be equally strong as a sinks. Let us begin with system 1. This is a simple lever. In the left-hand section, Y momentum flows in X direction. According to the lever rule, an angular momentum source of 100 times F0 is created here. The measurement unit is Newton times millimeters. This quantity could be transformed into Newton meters, but this is not necessary. In the right-hand section of the lever, Y momentum flows in minus X direction. So here there is a source of Z angular momentum with a force of 30 times I Y1. Since no angular momentum can flow through the pivotable joints, the sources and the sinks must be equally strong. Consequently, the sum of the two terms formulated above equals zero. Now we'll have a look at the stabilizer link between A and B. In this structural element, the momentum flows are directly coupled. The X momentum flowing in minus Y direction creates a sink of Z angular momentum with the force of 30 millimeters times I X1. If there was only this flow, then the Z angular momentum flowing out through the sink would bring the stabilizer link into a negative rotation. However, there is Y momentum flowing in minus X direction at the same time, creating a source of angular momentum. In order that the stabilizer link remains in balance, the sink must be equally strong as the source. Therefore, the product of 30 times I X1 equals the product of 70 times the sum of I Y1 and F0. Now, let's look at system 3, the angle lever. In the section facing upwards, X momentum flows in positive Y direction. This results in an angular momentum source of 30 times IX. In the other part of the lever, Y momentum flows in positive X direction. This results in an angular momentum sink of 30 times IY2. Here, the equilibrium condition also demands that the sources and sinks are equally strong. Consequently, momentum flow IX must be equal to momentum flow IY2. Now we can solve these three equations for the unknown quantities. The results are as follows. IY1 is 10 thirds of the applied force. IX1 is more than 10 times as strong as F0. And IY2 is equally strong as IX1. The calculation shows that through coupling, the momentum flow of 150 Newton applied at the handles results in an approximately 10 times stronger momentum flow at the bolt. In this second method, 
You do not need conditions of equilibrium, nor do you need Newton's third law of motion. Fewer equations can be made, so there is less math to do. Now, let's compare the two methods. In the classical method, the whole system must be parsed into rigid bodies. Then all the forces and angular momentums acting on each body must be indicated while making sure that the law of action and reaction is fulfilled in each case. Then the three equilibrium conditions are formulated for each body. In the end, the whole system of equations is solved for the unknown quantities. In the second method, which comes from systems physics, you begin with the given forces and turn them into momentum flows. Then, with the help of the lever rule, you formulate the couplings between the individual flows. In the end, the system of equations is solved for the unknown quantities, just as in the first method. The second method is more holistic and is therefore less susceptible to errors. There are fewer equations and no dependent ones, and the narrative aspect of being able to tell a kind of story about what happens is very valuable. The lever rule takes on a whole new form. In the lever, the momentum components flow laterally to their own reference direction and generate sources and sinks of the angular momentum. If the levers are connected in a pivotable manner, the sources must be equally strong as the sinks. The new method accommodates a long-standing desire of construction engineers. In their daily work, construction engineers often use a visual concept that they call force flow. A force is actually purely a stress resultant that cannot flow. A force is also a vector, so the associated flow would have to be described using a tensor. However, if you use momentum and angular momentum, you have six components for which six different flow diagrams can be drawn. The momentum flow acting on a body is a force, and the angular momentum flow is a torque. The momentum flows are linked by the lever rule. There are also other laws that apply that I haven't mentioned here. I believe that the method from systems physics is quite promising. Of course, it has to be further developed and adapted for teaching.